Hello, thanks. Welcome to Wednesday Prayer and Bible Study. We've been moving right along in the book of John, and our master text, as you should know if you don't know it by now, is John 442. And it says, Then they said to the woman, this is the woman at the well in Samaria, now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. And what we've been doing is going through the book of John and um, looking at it chapter by chapter, verse by verse, as the Holy Spirit leads and guides us into all things. Now today what we want to do Let's move into the 18th chapter of the book of John. And at this first verse of John, it says, Having said these things, Jesus left his disciples and went across the ravine of the curtain. There was a garden there, which he and his disciples entered. Now, as I studied this out, it goes on into, you know, Judas betraying him, but something happened there that is mentioned in the rest of the three gospel accounts of Jesus that he went into the Garden of Gethsemane. That's what it, where he went. And um, he prayed over there before Judas and the people, the temple priests and Roman soldiers and whoever came and got him and, and took him, arrested him. Now, when you look at uh, Matthew, this, uh, what happened in the garden, it was found in Matthew, the 26th chapter, verses 36 through 46, it also is in Luke, well, it's also in Mark, the 14th chapter, verses 32 to 42, and in Luke, chapter 22, verses 40 to 46. And the Holy Spirit gave me an option that this is important to talk about what happened in the garden because if I just keep moving through the book of John you won't really be able to hear Jesus for yourself and to make a choice whether he is the Christ the Savior of the world or not because it's very important the reason why we have uh, Wednesday prayer and Bible study is is to build you up in the faith it also is to give people a chance to receive Christ as their Savior, to be born again so that they can have an inheritance in the kingdom of God and receive eternal life and live forever. Even though your body will perish, your real self, which is spirit, will live forever. Now here in uh, Matthew, the 26th chapter, starts at the 36th verse, it says, um, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, Olive Press, and he told his disciples, Sit here while I go there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, he began to be grieved and greatly distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved, so that I am almost dying of sorrow. Stay here and stay awake and keep watch with me. Let's stop there. He said, my soul. Now, when you search this out, the scripture that 
I'm using the day as 1 Peter 2.24. He said, by so. In 1 Peter 2.24, it says, He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross, willingly offering himself on it as on the altar of sacrifice, so that we might die to sin become immune from the penalty and the power of sin and live for righteousness. For by his wounds you who believe have been healed. That's a very powerful verse because if you hear the gospel, the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the good news he did rise from the dead. When you receive that, it says if you believe that in your heart and you confess that with your mouth that you're saved, what happens also is that you get healed of any infirmity or disease or sickness or anything else you have. If you believe what this says here in 1 Peter 2.24, it says, for by his wounds, you who believe have been saved. And he told his disciples to watch. He also tells us to watch. In Matthew 24, 42, there's a verse there that says, So be alert, give attention, give strict attention, be cautious, and actively in faith. For you do not know which day, whether near or far, your Lord is coming. That's why it's so important to me that I come over here and minister the word to the saints that come over here. And also we upload our videos on YouTube so that whoever the Lord wants to hear, hear it can hear it. Because we don't know whether this is the last time that you'll be able to hear the gospel and be saved before you go home to be with the Lord. Because we don't know which day that we're going to depart off this earth. But he tells us that we have to watch. He also says in one scripture that we should watch and pray. And this is what Jesus is telling his disciples over here to stay here and stay awake and keep watch for me. So they was, he asked them to keep watch. Then in verse 39 of this uh, Matthew the 26th chapter, it says, um, And after going a little farther, he fell face down and prayed, saying, my Father, if it is possible, that is consistent with your will, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Very powerful verse. Jesus fell on his face. Now, when you search the scripture, there is, a, especially in the book of Numbers, we find out numbers of, uh, go with me, hold your place here in Matthew 26. You go to numbers, uh, the 16th chapter. Something happened over here. I was reading about it this morning. Matthew, uh, not Matthew, but numbers, the 16th chapter. Thank you, Lord. The 22nd verse, it says, um, uh, But they fell on their face before the Lord and said, O oh God, God of the spirits of all flesh, when one man sins, will you be angry with the entire congregation? Now, they were doing this because there was a rebellion going on in the camp. And... What hit me here, that the Lord 
will not destroy the whole congregation because of what some people are doing. In this case, what he did um, when Moses fell on his face, it says in the next verse, verse 23, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, say to the congregation, get away from around the tents of Korah and Dan and the other people and what the Lord was saying to me, if somebody is not doing what they're supposed to be doing in your congregation, you really need to get away from them because whatever the Lord has got planned for them, because, <laughs> you know, to destroy them, because that's what he does, he... Many people perish because they're, they're not with the Lord. They are pretending to be with him and they want to be in charge, but that ain't what the Lord called them to do. And, you know, a lot of times uh, you just have to fall on your face before the Lord and ask the Lord, you know, to have mercy on them. Because a lot of times people are doing things ignorantly. And a lot of times, they're not. And we don't know which is which. So we need to just fall on our face before the Lord, especially in prayer, like Jesus did here in the 26th chapter of Matthew. He fell on his face before the Lord. Now, if Jesus falls on his face before the Father, amen, we need to... Uh, Fall on our face before God, too. I mean, yeah, you can pray standing up. You can pray sitting down. You can pray laying down. But the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord or the reverence of the Lord. If you really reverence God the Father, you will fall on your face from time to time and pray to the Father. Prayer is communion with God. That means that you're asking God something, you're praising God for what he did, and you're not the one supposed to be doing the most talking. The one with the most knowledge is supposed to be doing the most talking, who is God. So when we fall on our face before the Lord, we're actually listening to what he has to tell us. And this is what Jesus is saying here in his 39th verse. He was saying, my father, if it is possible to take this cup from me, this cup. Now this cup that he's talking about, go with me to Hebrews, the fifth chapter. I remember when I was growing up in the, in the church that this minister was used to preach on the cup and at that time I didn't really understand exactly what he was saying about you know the cup because when you're young in the ministry you don't really understand what's going on with a lot of messages that you hear but as you get older and more spiritually mature then you understand what they were saying now here in uh Hebrews, the fifth chapter, the seventh verse, it says, In the days of his earthly ministry, they're talking about Jesus here, Jesus offered up both specific petitions and urged, urgent supplications for that which he needed, with fear and crying and tears to the one who was always able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission toward God, his sinless, and his unfailing determination to do the Father's will. Although he was a son who had never been disobedient to the Father, he learned active, special obedience through what he suffered. 
So that's the cup. That cup that he had was the cup of the sins of the whole world. He bore our sins. That's what he's, it was telling us in 1 Peter 2.24. He willingly bore our sins. And he was asking for that cup to be taken from him. But he said, yet not as I will, but as your will. Now in Psalm 40 verse 8 tells us, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your laws are written in my heart. Now when you look at, I have heard people praying this. I mean, I have done it myself when I was a young Christian. <clears throat> I would pray to the Lord for something, for somebody to be healed. You know, a lot of times I would go with the pastor to different people's houses and he would pray for them to be healed and he would say, not my will, but your will be done. And in different other cases, we pray like that. Not your will, but not my will, but your will be done. Right here, this prayer that Jesus is praying is a prayer of submission. He's not praying for somebody to be saved because we know it's God's will that he don't want nobody to perish, that all should come to repentance and be saved. We know it's not, uh, it is God's will. We know it's God's will for everybody to be healed. And that's what faith is about. Faith is knowing what the will of God is. So when we pray for somebody to be saved, we don't say, not my will, but your will be done. Or when we pray for somebody to be healed, we don't pray for, we don't say, not my will, but your will be done. Anywhere in the Gospels, you don't see when Jesus was praying for healing or for people to come to the Lord, he don't say nothing about his, not my will, but your will be done because Jesus knew the will of the Father. Amen? He knows the will of the Father. And when you look at uh, Philippians, well, how do you know this? Philippians, go with me to Philippians, the second chapter. We need to stop there for a minute. Because we're supposed to be Christians. So a Christian is Christ-like. We're supposed to be wanting to be just like Jesus. Amen? And do things just like Jesus done them. In Philippians, the second chapter, the eighth verse, it says, after he was found in terms of his outward appearance as a man, for a divinely appointed time, he humbled himself still farther by becoming obedient to the Father to the point of death, even the death of the cross. For this reason also he became, for this reason also, because he obeyed and so completely humbled himself, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in submission. That word pops up again, in submission, it popped up in Hebrews, the fifth chapter, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess and openly acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, sovereign God, to the glory of the Father. So, Jesus, when he was praying here, 
he was praying a prayer of submission. And when you study prayer, we're going to be looking at different types of prayers and how to pray. And, and different and some prayer principles as we move on in this Wednesday prayer and Bible study. But Jesus was praying a prayer of submission and commitment. And you know, today we don't have that type of submission and commitment in the church. Actually, we don't have people that are committed to even stand married. <laughs> they were married for a while and then when things are not going their way, they'll they'll leave it and this happens in the the job market too. A person might have a good job and but they're not committed to it. Jesus was submissive he submitted to God and he was committed to doing the will of God. Amen. And when you look at this um, being submitted, <laughs> amen, we find out because a lot of people, you know, they believe that submission is easy. Amen. Submission is not easy because the scriptures, let's just give you a few verses that have submission in it. And it starts with, go when you look at Genesis 16, 9, this is Hagar when she was acting up with uh, Sarah. You know, Sarah gave Abram Hagar to be his wife and to you know, to go into her and have it, to see if she could have a child. And once uh, Hagar conceived, everybody knew that it wasn't Abraham's problem that they couldn't have a baby, that it was Sarah's, and she was acting arrogant and all that. And then Abraham told Sarah, you know, do what you want to to her. I mean, she's your servant. So uh, hey, uh, Sarah started treating her harshly and humiliating her and all of that and uh, so Hagar ran away and it says in Genesis 16 9 the angel of the Lord said to her go back to your mistress and submit humbly to her authority so she had some to do something that wasn't easy for her to do. She had to submit to her mistress. And then it tells us in Proverbs 16, 3, commit your works to the Lord, submit and trust them to him, and your plans will succeed if you respond to his will and guidance. We have to submit ourselves. Like I'm saying, submission is not easy. It also tells us in James 4, 7, so submit to the authority of God, resist the devil, stand firm against him, and he will flee from you. Submission is not easy. You have to submit. It tells, it, the scripture is telling us that we have to submit. That's something that you have to do. Just like Jesus submitted to God in the garden. He said, if, you know, if you take this cup from me, is there any other way that this can be accomplished? Not my will, but your will be done. But he, he was praying a prayer of submission. And here's another thing about submission. Submission does not force somebody to do something. Amen? You can't force nobody to submit to you. It don't work that way. And also, submission is not agreement. A lot of people say, well, I agree with, you know, what he's doing here, so I'll, I'll submit to that. And I agree with this that he's doing, and I'll submit to that. But what he wants me to do now, I don't agree to it, so I'm not submitting to it. 
That's not what submission is about. Submission is doing what you, the Lord has told you to do. Amen? You, you have to submit yourself. Let me give you a, go to Hebrews, um, the 12th chapter. We need to stop, really get this in our spirit as we, before we move on. In Hebrews, uh, the 12th chapter, God's word is powerful. Hebrews 12, verse 7 says, You must submit to correction for the purpose of discipline. God is dealing with you as with sons, for what son is there whom his father does not discipline? And then when you jump down to verse um, 9, it says, Moreover, we have earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we submitted and respected them for training us. Should we not much more willingly submit to the Father of Spirits and live by learning His discipline? That's why you want to submit to God. I mean, He's going to discipline you. I, there's a lot of things in my life that I, I didn't want to get disciplined on by my earthly father. And, and now that... I know about my heavenly father, and he's telling me things that I shouldn't do, I shouldn't say, and and I have to submit to that. I, I me, willingly have to submit. It also tells us here in uh, Hebrews 13th chapter, the 17th verse, it says, Obey your spiritual leaders, Submit to them, recognizing their authority over you, for they are keeping watch over your souls and continuously guarding your spiritual welfare as those who will give an account of their stewardship of you. Let them do this with joy and not with griefs and groans, for this would be... Um, no benefit to you. By me being a spiritual leader, I know exactly what it's talking about here because a lot of times I, I say things when I'm teaching that people do say, mm, mm. but the Bible says that if you're in any denomination or any, we call them churches, you should submit to your spiritual leaders. But it also goes back, if your spiritual leaders are not leading you in a Christ-like manner, like in Numbers, they were actually these, some people were going against their spiritual leaders and the Lord had to discipline them. So. If your spiritual leaders are not doing right, God will discipline them his own. It, when, when we step into a role of, of a minister or a teacher or a pastor, we are representing the Lord. We're supposed to say what the Lord is saying. And if we are not completely submish, submitted to God, we won't say what God is saying all the way. We will twist the word of God. It also tells us, uh, I thought this was interesting, in Hebrews, the fifth chapter, the 25th verse, this is out of the Amplified, it says, Wives, be subject to your own husband as a service to the Lord. Now, when I looked at that out of the King James and also out of the Young's Literal Translation and the Strong's Translation, I noticed in the Amplified it had it was in um, it, it it says submission it says subject but in the the, the original text it says submit and then as I studied this out 
let me read you something here real quick. It says, subject to someone means you will be under someone's control or rule or will be complete or will be complying with someone's wishes, orders, or appetites. Submit to someone means surrendering or giving in to someone. It doesn't necessarily mean you will be someone's subject. So there's a difference in words. And what I do, I, I use Amplified now, but I always go back to the Strong's Concordance and the Young's Literal Translation and the King James Version to see what was the original word in there. And I found out that to be subject to somebody is not the same as submitting to somebody. Amen. So let's go back to Matthew 26 chapter here and pick this back up at the 40th verse. It says, And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to, to Peter, So, you men could not stay awake and keep watch with me for one hour? Wow. Keep actively watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. So he's telling us to watch that we don't come into temptation. Now, when you look at Luke, the eighth chapter, about the parable of the, the sower and all of that, it tells us in Luke 8, 13, it says, Those on the rocky soil are the people who, when they hear, receive and welcome the word with joy. So a lot of people, when they hear somebody talking or teaching or preaching, they receive it with joy. But these have no firmly grounded root. They believe for a while, and in time of trial and temptation, they fall away from me and abandon their faith. So this is why Jesus wants us to watch and pray that we don't come into temptation. We don't want to, you know, have joy one minute and then the next minute we abandon Jesus and fall from away from our faith. We don't want that to happen to us. It says that the spirit is willing. Paul says here in 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, Paul had to deal with this himself. In 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, the 27th verse, it says, but like a boxer, I strictly discipline my body to make it my slave. So that's letting you know that your body is not you. How could Paul discipline his body and he's, and he's saying that his body is him? No, he, he was talking about his spiritual person. We are a spirit, we possess a soul and live in this body. So he says, but like a boxer, I strictly discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached the gospel to others, I myself will not somehow be disqualified as unfit for service. We see this happening in the world today. A lot of people are not disciplined their body. <laughs> and by them not disciplined their body, letting their body have control over them, because Jesus said, Phew, he said to us, the body is weak. The spirit is what is willing, but the body is weak, so you have to discipline your body. And also, go with me to Galatians. Let's make it a little plainer to you. Galatians, the fifth chapter. 
When you look at Galatians, the fifth chapter, the 16th verse, it says, But I say, walk habitually in the Holy Spirit, seek Him, and be responsive, responsive to His guidance. And then you will certainly not carry out the desires of the sinful nature which responds impulses without regard for God and His uh, precepts. For the sinful nature has its desires which is which is opposed to the spirit and the desires of the spirit oppose the sinful nature. For these to the sinful nature and the spirit are in direct opposition to each other, <laughs> continually in conflict, so that you as believers do not always do whatever good things you want to do. This is what Jesus was telling them in the garden that our spirit and our flesh is in opposition of each other. There's a fight going on. This is why Paul had to even use the term, like a boxer, I strictly discipline my body. That's what we have to do. We have to be completely led by the Spirit of God. We talked about that in previous lessons, that we have to be completely led by His Spirit, and we have to be spirit-led, not body-led, and especially not mind-led. Amen? Now, as we go back to Matthew, the 26th chapter, it tells us here, in verse 42, He went away a second time and prayed, saying, Father, if it... it if it cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. Again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for them a third time, saying the same words once more. Then he re turned to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Listen, the hour of my sacrifice is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners whose way and nature is to oppose God. That's, that's a lot in there. So that's what sinners do. They oppose God. Amen. You as a saint, you're supposed to submit to God. Amen. Submit to God and you're supposed to resist the devil. You're not supposed to be opposed to God. And, and if you know about that your, your spirit and your body are in this battle, you have to really stay in prayer. You have to stay alert and stay in prayer. And, and here's another one thing as we end this that I'm going to, that I Lord gave me. Go with me to First Corinthians. Uh, so go with Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians, the twelfth chapter. Very familiar text. I've heard this preached all kinds of ways. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I mean. I, what I try to I what I do I try to say what God is saying because we find this out that that's what Jesus did he always said what he heard the father say amen and he didn't say no more or no less Amen. He, he always was saying what the Father said, and we saw this as we went through the scriptures, that Jesus did not come to do his will, 
but to do the will of the one that sent him. Amen. And when you look here in uh, 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, this is Paul talking about a thorn in the flesh. And I've heard this preached all kinds of ways. I probably, I'm not going to elaborate on it. I'm just going to say what the Spirit <clears throat> tells me to say and which is the Word of God. If you look at this starting at the 7th verse of this 12th chapter, he says, Because of the surpassing greatness and extraordinary nature of the revelation which I received from God for this reason, to keep me from thinking of myself as important, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan, to torment and harass me, to keep me from exalting myself. This thorn in the flesh was the Judaizers, which, as you study this out, it wasn't no sickness. It's not God's will for you to be sick. It says, concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might leave me. And that then brought me right back to Matthew 22nd, 26th chapter. Jesus prayed three times for this cup to be taken from him, and he and, and he said, nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. And he said, if there's any other way that you can do this, let this cup pass from me. And he went back, he, he prayed again, and, and prayed again. Now here, over here, Paul prayed three times. He pleaded with the Lord three times that it might lead me. But he said to me, now this is what the Lord said to Paul, and he's also saying to us, but he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My loving kindness and my mercy are more than enough, always available, regardless of the situation. For my power is being perfected and is complete and shows itself more efficiently in your weakness. Therefore, I will... All the more gladly boast in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may completely enfold me and dwell in me. So I am well pleased with weaknesses, with insults, with distress, with persecution, and with difficulties for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak in human strength, then I am strong, truly able, truly powerful, truly drawn from God's strength. That is very, very powerful. When, when you start picking up on this, because one thing that it says here, and um, when you look at this same account, um, Luke, the 22nd chapter, the, the, Luke, the 22nd chapter, it tells us that, um, let's just start at the 39th verse, just a little bit of reading. It says, and he came out and went, as it was his habit, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. When he arrived at the place called Gethsemane, he said to them, Pray continuously that I may not fall. He said to them, Pray continuously that you may not fall into temptation. And he withdrew from them and by a stone's throw and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup of divine wrath from me, yet not my will, but Always your will be done. Now an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in agony, deeply distressed and anguish, almost to the point of death, he prayed more intensely 
and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down on the ground. When he arose from prayer, he came to his disciples and found them sleeping from sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not fall into temptation. That's what we, that's why we pray. We pray that we don't come into temptation. Now I hope that helped you. We're going to move on as the Spirit leads us in this class. Have a good day.